welcome Spartans to Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. I'm your host Tom, and with me today is Aaron. Hi guys. Krista. Hey, what's up? And Oran. Yep, I'm here too. And this week's topic continues our lore series, The Road to Infinite, with the Jiruhanai. But before we get started on the Jiruhanai, Podcast Evolved is host to a variety of different shows. So the show you're listening to now is our main show where we talk Halo news, Halo laws, and also to you, the listeners. And then our other shows are Mission Debrief, Halo Book Club, and also Builds with Blocks. And you can learn more about each of them on our awesome website, halopodcastevolved.com. If you're already a fan of the show, we ask you to rate us and leave a review. We greatly appreciate all of the feedback that we receive from our listeners to improve the quality of our shows. And, as well, we would like to take this moment to say a massive thank you to all of our patrons for their continued support. So thank you so much to all of our Patreon members. Thank Thank you. you. Yes, thank you guys. As a part of our Patreon, our patrons receive a variety of exclusive rewards, such as early episodes, unique swag, and access to our own soundtrack album featuring 18 unique songs. And you can head over to patreon.com slash Halo Podcast Evolved to learn more. And finally, we also want to encourage our listeners to support Audible, where they can enjoy the growing collection of Halo novels all in one place, along with thousands of other novels, guided wellness programs, and much more. You can use the URL audibletrial.com slash podcast evolved to learn more and start your free trial today. And I am going to say on the back of Audible, Loads of cool stuff up there. I've just started book one of Harry Potter. Oh, so there is I love that Halo lots book. of cool stuff that you can check out. <laughs> it's a great Halo book. <laughs> it's a really good Halo book. Okay, so what have we done on Halo this week? Aaron, why don't you start? I I did no Halo this week again. <gasps> Boo! I definitely didn't. Sorry, the guy I'm playing with at the minute uh, just had a baby, so there'd be no Halo with him for a while. Shoutouts to Chris. Hi, Chris. I played some Division. I was talking to Tom before the show. My nephew somehow managed to trick me into playing Fallout Shelter again. Oh, no, really? Yep, I re-downloaded <laughs> that on my phone. <laughs> you make it sound like it's a bad game. I mean, it's not. It just takes forever to do anything. It's like, oh, I'm going to send my Fallout guy out for like 20 days. So now i got to wait 20 days for him to come back and then he's just going to die halfway through. But they've made a few changes since I last played. So I like the addition of Mr. Handy. That makes life a lot easier when you don't have to tap the game yourself. He's a little bit handy. I like games that play themselves. Makes life a lot easier. I hate actually playing games. I wish there was some kind of medium where I could just watch the story unfold without me having to do anything. Yeah, like, listen, the best thing about a clicker game is the point where the clicker starts to play itself. And you just watch the numbers go up. I find that for a lot of games. Don't really think I did much else. It's been a very bad week for doing anything because my dog had an operation this week. She's all good, by the way. But she makes for a terrible patient and it's involved a lot of late nights and i don't think i slept on monday at all i had to sit up with her on monday night and it turns out that any time i went to fall asleep she poked me in the ribs with her foot to wake me back up because apparently if she wasn't going to sleep i had to suffer with her (laughs) oh my god wow she's not very nice is she (laughs) she's a dick if i have to suffer you have to suffer I think I was awake for about 37 hours between Monday and Tuesday, so that just wasn't a good couple of days. It was just on her tail. How how much how bad could it be? It was just on her tail, right? It was, but I think the stitches were it's like a four inch cut stitched up, so it was quite sore. And the problem is it's on the part of her tail that flexes, it's right at the base. So every time she moved or sat or did anything else, it flexed and hurt. She has a very low threshold for pain. That's pretty much been my week. Thankfully, she's nearly back to herself now, so it's not too bad. 
I'm just dreading going back to the vets next week to get the stitches out because I don't know how I'm going to persuade her to go back. <laughs> she's like, oh, hell no, I'm never going anywhere with you again. Yeah, she, she's not going to go willingly, so we'll see how that goes. That's been pretty much it. I haven't done a big pile else. I want to go back actually and play Stardew Valley because they've done a big update. I've been thinking about that too. I, I have my Switch, like I keep carrying it around, but now... I find myself sitting watching Vikings and playing Fallout Shelter and I just, I don't have time for a third game. But that's it. No Halo. Very sorry. I'm waiting on my copy of Point of Light to arrive. It hasn't yet. I'm last man standing, so that'll put me under loads of pressure to read that. It's short. Don't worry. Yeah. (laughs) It's all right. You can get it done in a week. (laughs) Like me. We'll just transition right over to me, Tom. I'll help you out here. I've actually done a lot of Halo this week. Um, With all the snow that's been going on, I've been able to do some reading at work and playing games at the house. I have points of light. I got, you know, some of us received the the early review copies and I'm I'm the first one to finish it, which I think is a first. It's a first, yeah. Every other Halo book club that we've ever done, I'm always either the last or or near last to catch up on whatever book that we're going to be talking about. Uh, so it feels pretty great in some ways to kind of know what's going on, but I also feel so alone because I can't talk to anyone about it. Yep, welcome to our world. <laughs> we'll be doing that book club with you guys real soon. I recommend everyone check it out if they're a fan of the characters. I think that this trilogy is probably my favorite trilogy of kind of the Halo collection of of stories. I'm really excited to see kind of where it goes. And then I also did some Master Chief collection. I've been mopping up on some of the last hard achievements that I have, and I, I will toot my own horn, and I have completed Halo 3 and Halo 3 ODST on Legendary in under three hours. Pretty good. Shout out to Silver Scorpion, a.k.a. Halo Completionist, for his guides. Very intuitive, and, you know, even if you don't follow them to a T, they definitely help you out. And yeah, so, that's what I've done. Cool. Krista, have you had any crossover with that by any chance? I have Halo Point of Light. It is a novel by Kelly Gay. That's it, that's all you're allowed to say. You can't say any more <laughs> about the novel. I'm about two-thirds of the way into the book. I've got about maybe 100 pages left. And it is very good. I'm enjoying it very much. And I've also played some Halo 5. That's it. (laughs) No? Cool. Nice and simple. I like it. I know. I did Halo stuff, so... You're better than Aaron. Yeah. Hey! (laughs) I have actually been replaying all of the campaigns on Master Chief Collection. There you go. On Legendary. Uh, On Heroic. I'm not a legend, sadly. Um, So my good friend Arthur, Arthur, shout out to you if you're listening. You won't be because you have no idea that this exists. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like you need to tell Arthur about your podcast. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But no, he had a PlayStation 4 and then he made the jump to the Xbox Series X and got Master Chief Collection on Games Pass and was like, yo, Tom, do you want to revisit all of the campaigns? So in the space of like three days, we've done all of Reach, and we are about a third of the way through Combat Evolved. So has he has he have any experience with Halo, the Halo games? Yeah, he was like, back in the day, <laughs> I, I feel weird saying that, I'm only 21. Well, Halo is 20 years old this year. Yeah, there you go. It's a year older than me. <laughs> no, a year younger. I can I can do maths, guys. I can do maths, I promise. Back when I was at school, basically, Arthur was one of the people who I played Halo Reach multiplayer with, which was like my first multiplayer experience at Halo. So it's been really nice actually revisiting the games with somebody who was part of that the first time around for me. It's just been nice kind of like rekindling our friendship through it as well which has been pretty cool because i mean obviously if you guys didn't know there's a pandemic on at the moment so we can't really see each other so it's been nice doing it that way and then apart from that i also just absolutely not on the halo front but on the xbox front smashed out the call of duty black ops cold war campaign that's not Halo. hashtag call of duty for life all right all right you're fired get off (laughs) <laughs> so, Oran, were you going to host the law segment today, yeah? 
I will, yes. So, like Tom graciously introduced at the top of the show, uh, we're going to continue our road to Infinite. Last time we discussed the Oni Archive, and if you recall, that is the six-part in-universe informational video series that is was tied to the real-world PC releases of each Halo game in the Master Chief Collection. And the videos were produced by Oni Section 2 under Director Schaefer's public awareness campaign to educate United Earth government civilians on the application of the Spartan program and their impact during the final moments of the Human Covenant War as well as some insight into the, a growing new threat on Requiem. And that's kind of how it was paired up in, in universe. And so we talked about those six pieces of uh, videos, and we discussed kind of their information, the propaganda involved, and there's also some background narratives that, ex- that get explored. So if you missed that episode, you can go back through our podcast feed and catch up, or you can check the episode out on our website or on our YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about the Gerald Hane also known as the Brutes, uh, that have been featured in, in most of the Halo games. We we know that the Banished are an infinite as of this recording, and we've already covered the Banished in our Covenant Remnants episode from a couple months back, and we've kind of also covered other quote-unquote enemies that could appear uh, or could be a threat uh, in some capacity in Halo Infinite, and those would be the Flood, Sentinels, and Prometheans, or kind of the mechanical composed Prometheans that we fight as opposed to the forerunner Prometheans of of time long ago. And since the Jirohane is the primary species within the Banished, we felt that that these, quote, damn apes deserve their own episode, to quote Johnson over there. And uh, so we'll kind of go into their biology, their beliefs, their society and background, as well as kind of the more conventional understandings of them within their role of the Covenant, and just kind of see what could be explored further in Infinite. And so we'll kind of discuss that. So I'll just kind of take us through all this, and if you guys just want to chime in about anything, it's a little bit of a history lesson, if you were. But the Jirohanai, they're a uh, carnivorous sapien species called of pseudo yersin mammals. They have a simioid physiology, which means they're just ape-like. They have thick skin, shaggy fur, and fangs. They have three digits uh, with an opposable thumb on their hands, so they can use weapons and you know, interact with objects, and two digits with large claws on their feet. They're about 250 to 280 centimeters tall, which is about 8 foot 6, 9 foot 2 range, and they weigh anywhere from 510 to 680 kilograms to over 1,000 uh, to 1,500 pounds. So they're quite large. I didn't realize that they like actually towered over Spartans because Spartans are like seven feet tall. I think when we ever encounter them in the game, if you're ever close enough to a brute, you know, their shields are usually off and they're like hunched over and about to like charge you. So it's, it's crazy to think that these guys are just absolutely massive. Another piece of info that I found quite interesting is they have a strong sense of smell and they can actually smell the pheromones of other Jirohane to tell how they are feeling and that Upon maturity, the Jirohanai develop a way to repress these pheromones to kind of keep those feelings secret uh, because they they kind of have that as like a vulnerability. And so they don't want other Jirohanai to kind of know how they feel and all that kind of stuff because there's a lot of aggression and kind of butting of the heads that we'll kind of get into that the uh, the species just does to a whole. Uh, Like I mentioned, the humans give them the nicknames Brutes because of just kind of how brutal they are. And then the Sanghili have a nickname as well. It's a little bit more of an insult. And they call the Jirohane Jir, Jiraul, which is a play on the word Aul, which means wood. And so I think they're basically calling the Jirohane wood or dumb because you're, you know, you could be as dumb as wood. <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. Thank you for explaining that joke to dumb people <laughs> like me. It's appreciated. <laughs> well, you're welcome, Tom. Uh, let's see, the home world is uh, Doisak. It's a tropical world that is kind of Earth-like with rainforests and volcanic activities. Gravity is actually twice as strong as the gravity on Earth. And the terrain is dominated by magma and magnetism. They believe in worshipping totems and idols. And they kind of revolve around the lunar cycle because Doisak has three moons. That's kind of where their religious beliefs came from before the covenant kind of came up and preached about the great journey. Uh, So we've seen this next sort of bit about their society in games and that their society is very authoritative 
authoritarian dictatorship, which is controlled by the strongest male. And we see that a lot because in, in, in the books and in other Halo mediums, if, if a brute were a challenge, whoever the chieftain is that's leading the pack, who you know, whoever wins that fight is then now the person in charge. And it's, it's, it's sort of similar in some Sangheili cultures, but it's very much about, I think I'm the best, therefore I'm going to challenge you. And, you know, they kind of just go from there. And, and that's kind of how their system of government kind of goes around. All the brutes are very much in a fierce pack culture with very strong family bonds. They have a patriarchy because of that, where we're, of course, is governed by whoever is the strongest of, of among everybody else. And another bit of interesting note here is that because it's a, a very, very strong and hostile patriarchy, patricide is a common side effect, which is the killing of one's father, which is pretty, pretty grim. And I'm pretty sure we've had that in a couple of Halo novels of uh, certain individuals killing their fathers just to be, quote unquote, better. It's not very nice. It isn't very nice. Not at all. I think it's Contact Harvest, the brute that Tartarus goes on to kill. I think he kills his father in combat. Caster? No, I think it's Mac Maccabus. Caster's from Keepers of the One Freedom. He pitches it like this uh, good, glorious thing where his dad, toward the end of the fight, like puts his hands down and takes the blow to the head with a smile on his face. And it's like, it was a touching moment between father and son before I killed the <laughs> fuck out of him. Jesus. Yep. They're really nice people. You, you, you love to have them as neighbors. You can understand why they're so bloody aggressive, because they're constantly scared that they're going to get their heads caved in by the person stood next to them. Yeah, pretty much. I've been dealing with my dog all week. I am totally prepared for brutes. Not a problem. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Has she? Have you been worried that she was going to do the same thing? Pick up the the gravity hammer and just look look down onto you? If I woke up in the middle of the night and she was above me, I wouldn't put it past her, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> so female Jirohane serve as mainly mothers and caretakers. They don't have any military roles. So they're just kind of just in the background. It's really all that we know about them. I want to see lady brutes. Brute what? I want to see brute ladies really badly. I want to, oh. I want them to be not in like a dodgy All right, net. you're creeping me out. <laughs> I want the brute ladies to be bigger than the brute men. I want them to be even more terrifying because that seems about right. <laughs> Which oh will make God. it all the funnier that they don't serve in like the military. Like they're they're more aggressive and and they and that's where the the males get their aggression from, but they don't do any of the decision making because they they're just too powerful. So I, I'm ready to blow your mind here. Oh Jesus! The lady in Resident Evil Village is actually a female Jirohano. Oh, perfect! <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me she's a shaved brute? Yes. <laughs> So that's why Halo retweeted that photo on Twitter. <laughs> it comes full circle. She seems like a nice lady. Until she turns into an octopus. To continue on from that, we have I have a word here that I'm going to try to pronounce. I think it's pronounced Skeens. S-K-E-I-N-S. -E they are the largest social division within the Jirohane, and they're kind of divided into two social beliefs, where the Ratol... It is a more primitive and aggressive bunch of individuals who, who think that that's kind of the way to show your status among your fellow Jirohane. And then you have the Vahiloth, which are the more sophisticated and open to new ideas and progressive brutes that want to you know, change things and, and be the peacekeepers, so to speak. And these two social div uh, divisions are kind of the main planetary conflicts that kind of arise throughout Dosak's history, the Jirohana history. They're constantly butting heads, constantly fighting each other. The planet is kind of in a outstanding civil war on a planetary scale, but it doesn't get as big until a little bit later, which I'll touch on. But to kind of just give a little bit of prelude to it, there's just constant fighting and bickering between these two groups. Uh, like I mentioned, the Jirohane are a kind of a pack-like society and culture, kind of how they're arranged and born into with a strong sense of family. Different packs are led by a prominent chieftain, sometimes referred to a pack master, and often wields a ceremonial gravity hammer that denotes his status. And this gravity hammer has been passed down from generation from generation within that pact. And the chieftain rules their pact like an empire, 
it grows and is measured by the success on and off battlefields. So that's kind of where the continual aggression of these beasts have throughout their history. And you also have war chieftains. They rule over larger and more dominant Jirohanai packs or sometimes a like collective packs. So they'll kind of have a group that uh, that kind of are rallied together during wartime. A name for that is also called like alpha tribes or master packs of, of kind of dominant clans or, or grouplings of multiple packs. The, the big thing for that is that you find that as the sort of Jilhana empire kind of just grows is that you have all these, these smaller packs and smaller divisions within these, these larger alpha tribes that then make up legions, which then make up groups like the Banished. So we'll kind of talk a little bit of that in, in more detail, but that's just kind of how the, the different hierarchy goes of how everyone's kind of grouped together to fight what they want to fight. Can I pick your brain? Sure. That's weird. <laughs> Was Decimus classed as a war chieftain? I believe so. I believe him and his brother Pavium were considered war chieftains. I'd have to check. Uh, Decimus is the lieutenant. You're thinking of Pavium and Voridus? Oh, right. Uh, Decimus is the big guy you kill in Halo Wars 2, isn't he? Yeah, the guy in the mech suit. Isn't he a lieutenant? He probably is a war chief, but... He might be a lieutenant to Atriox. Yeah. But I would imagine he's still a war chief then because he, he has a large... Unless a, uh, a, a lieutenant is at a higher status than a war chief then. To where maybe Pavium and uh, what's his other bro- what's his brother's name? Vordis. V- Vordis. Maybe they're they're war chieftains to uh, to their collective groups. Because later on, because we do have we do have legion. Let's kind of skip ahead here. We do have legion masters, which lead what what the banished call a legion of uh, of brutes. And within that legion, you have again multiple clans and multiple tribes. And multiple packs that this legion sort of makes up, and it's it's almost like a, a following, and, a, and a, it's kind of their own civilization within this legion. And uh, so I don't know if Decimus was on kind of that level, but he was at least you know the second in command to Atriox, so he could be at even a higher status than a war chieftain on a technical level. The only thing I could think of is possibly maybe he isn't allowed his own clan because he's a lieutenant. Like there's. I forget what they call it. Atriox is like inner circle of lieutenants. Kind of sound like Atriox's clan in a way. Maybe they're not war chiefs in their own right because maybe they don't have a pack of their own. It's the only thing I could see. Or maybe maybe, you know, Atriox is the war chief then and then Decimus is just his lieutenant. Yeah. I'm just I, I only ask because I'm trying to kind of get my head around just how big the banished is in comparison, in, like in comparison to other brute factions. Because obviously in Halo Three, you come across war chieftains very rarely. So I'm I'm just trying to like picture in my head. Well, if that's a rare occurrence and they're like one in a blue moon, how big must the banished be if they have several of them? If that makes sense. I think the the way that this picture is getting painted for me and how, how how when I was kind of doing the research is that it just continues to kind of grow and you have just kind of like in the you know any other traditional military you have your your minors and then you have your majors and then you have your 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 leadership positions and then as you just keep going up there's there's that kind of umbrella that encompasses all these other factions so then when you distill and kind of give orders down the chain of command it kind of just keeps on going so I imagine war chieftains is kind of like like if you were to have a council of war, you would have you know maybe a dozen war chieftains if that's how big your your army is, and then Atriox and Decimus would be kind of at the top of the table. For in, in, in the example of the banished, the only other thing I can think is the the lack of chieftains in Halo Three could also be to do with the fact by the time you get to fighting on the Ark, you're like limited to the last of Truth's forces, so like he may not have had that many left at that stage. He had a like a pretty limited number, not including whoever the elites killed in orbit before it ever starts. So that might be the only reason that you might normally see more chieftains, except they all died at the hands of the shipmaster. That's a really good point. I wouldn't have thought of, yeah, Aaron. Every chieftain with a gravity hammer that you fight in like Halo 3 or Halo Reach, like they're the leader of whatever clan that they're a part of. 
because they have that gravity hammer. And so every time you kill one of them, that's that's one pack that's getting sort of, <laughs> for lack of a better word, decimated because you killed their leader. But then this, you know, the war chieftain is supposed to command and control multiple packs and multiple clans that's under their supervision and leadership. No, that makes sense. And I'm also impressed you didn't say that it's a pack at a time getting hammered. <laughs> Right, so kind of getting into that pack of getting hammered and all that stuff, we have combat style. The brutes are very animalistic and primitive because they, you know, they're very ape-like. Uh, they have strong hand-to-hand combat skills and very prone of fits of rage and aggression. And we kind of see a lot of that in Halo Three and, and other Halo games where they berserk and charge the player. Uh, they even interpret direct eye contact as a challenge and will sometimes instigate fights because of it. So don't stare too longly at a brute if you see one. These guys have some issues. <laughs> They're killing their family. Like, you can't even look at the guys without them, like, going super aggro on you. Are they all <laughs> roided up? Is their atmosphere, like, steroids on their home planet? Their gravity is twice as, as uh, harsh as the Earth. And they're, you know, twice as tall almost as, as like most humans. And so like their their strength to com- to combat their gravity just makes them super gorillas on Earth. That's why they can like leap so far because they're they're like there's like if we were jumping on the moon. I'm not I don't think that's a direct comparison, but just kinda think about that. They they do have a lot of very similar primate things because I'm pretty sure I've seen documentaries where people have spoken about, you know, folks in the wild with gorillas and they keep saying to them don't make eye contact he will tear you in half don't make eye contact and you're like okay so lastly for combat the jilhane prefer using weapons from their home world and their hell their, their weapons aren't overly notable for being extremely or they're no they are notable for being extremely dangerous and somewhat primitive when you have all these blade attachments to their weapons so you have your spikers and your mullers your brute shots and your gravity hammers again that's still kind of Almost hand-to-hand combat feel and very animalistic and brutal. Very dangerous and deadly. Even if it's not the high-powered plasma that the Covenant and Sanghealy used to fare. So that's kind of their general overview, I'd say, of like them as a race. To kind of go into a little bit of their history. Because it is a little interesting of just how aggressive these guys are. To go all the way back to the beginning, the Jirohane were indexed by the Librarian and reseeded on Dosak after the firing of the Halo Ray, just like humanity was on Earth. But then we'll jump thousands of years after that. And despite their constant aggression and civil conflict, the Jirohane proved intelligent enough to achieve spaceflight and spacefaring status, which then eventually led to a massive conflict that was uh, effectively a 10-year war known as the First Immolation that engulfed the whole planet. And what before was two sort of factions of belief, butting heads and having aggression towards each other across the planet, but on kind of smaller scale, eventually led to fires and nuclear you know, holocaust at times across this planet and almost caused the destruction of the planet and... <laughs> pretty much eradicated the species like they were pretty much on the verge of endangering themselves and it was also during this time that we learned about chieftain chieftain rucked who is an ancestor of Maccabus and tartarus from of course contact harfist as well as halo 2 he captain or chieftain rucked killed thousands of jirohanai around dosak and eventually earned a name the fist of rucked for his clan's warhammer that later appears all the way in halo 2 so a cool little note there. And then after this 10-year war, uh, it didn't really say how it ended. It just kind of it just kind of did. So I think they were just kind of tired of fighting each other or did they just reach a point to where they're like, "All right, we need to like tamper our aggression a little bit and just start rebuilding the uh the planet." And it was at that point that they started doing all that. And then the Covenant came and discovered the Jirohane and showed them their picture book of what the Grave Journey is all about and absorbed them into the Covenant hegemony in 2492. There's um, a really cool note there about them having nuclear weapons. That really stands out to me. Because when you look at them, you kind of think that like, if they didn't have the technology of the Covenant, they'd be a little bit less technologically advanced, perhaps, than humanity. But actually, the fact that 
looking at that, they'd already gone through their nuclear age and then come back out the other side of it, suggests that they're a little bit more technologically advanced than a lot of people give them credit for. No, very much so. And and there there's no doubt that the Covenant, uh, like Armada and technology, definitely advanced their species. But yeah, it, it would have been interesting to see the Covenant arrive at Dosek before this uh, planetary civil war, because the, the Brutes could have been a little bit more combative, perhaps? Yeah, I could see that. Definitely a very interesting note there. But then within the Covenant, in the beginning at least, the Jirohani primarily served as Covenant shock troopers and the secret police that was kind of described in the article. We learn a little bit about this in our, or not our, but in the Rise of Atriox series, kind of talk about how brutes were effectively just kind of kill swads that would just be dropped into some almost unwinnable mission and the covenant didn't seem to have any sort of remorse for what became of them and some brutes just kind of blindingly followed the great journey and followed the the new belief that the prophets were kind of preaching but then you had other brutes who were a little bit more smarter and were like hang on a minute this uh this doesn't look so right and in the midst of all that, the Sangheili and them very quickly grew disdainful of each other and didn't like each other and had a lot of continued butting heads, so to speak. But because the Sangheili were already regarded highly of the prophets and were in charge of the Covenant's military, the kind of un- a union of different Sangheili commanders very quickly convinced the Covenant High Council to kind of pose these restrictions for the Jirohane in terms of like technology and overall sort of voice within the covenant just you know further suppressing them so kind of tom again what you're saying is yeah they're they're definitely capable of more and and even in the early years the covenant suppressed them to to take advantage of them it's quite interesting when you look at it as well because actually the covenant did adopt quite a bit of their technology because vehicles like the chopper and the prowler i'm not sure that the covenant would necessarily have had much input in those they kind of feel like vehicles that the brutes already had access to anyway i mean obviously with the prowler i imagine the plasma turret was a covenant edition but beyond that i could quite easily see them already having those kinds of vehicles well the chopper was made by an engineer during contact Har- harvest he was repurposing um some of the cuz co- harvest is obviously a farm planet so it repurposed some of the um pr- like plows and shit like that and was trying to make a gift for humanity cuz contact harvest is all about the first uh the first contact with uh the covenant and humanity and so the engineer's like yeah this isn't going good i'm going to make them a vehicle so they're super happy and then the brutes are like ah oh, shit let's kill people with this and then they killed people with it that is mad i never knew that that was the origin of that maybe you should read some <laughs> books <laughs> krista can i book in some like history lessons is that a thing <laughs> yeah i can tutor you i'm i'm now available for halo tutoring it's um 117 dollars every single session and it's a um it's a it's an hour and a half session 90 minutes let me check my bank account and i'll get back to you <laughs> all right perfect perfect um i also offer counseling for three four three dollars as well Three four three dollars just sounds like the currency that three four three employees use at their office. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you've been a good, you've done a good job this week, Joe. Here's a three four three buck. Go spend it on a smoothie. Yeah, I wonder how many how many three four three dollars Jeff gets every time he writes a new piece of lore. Maybe he gets negative ones. <laughs> <laughs> They're like you're complicating things, Jeff. We don't like it. We're taking away some three four three bucks. And it's all—it's like the the bad currency tra- like uh, exchanges for any sort of just like like micro what's it called microtransactions and in, in video games where it's like it's not one dollar to one you know my transaction or whatever. So no, it's like a penny. Yeah, <laughs> it's like three dollars equals like two and a half, <laughs> three for three dollars. Can we set this up as a virtual currency and then get Reddit to ridiculously amplify the value of it? Oh, yeah, instead of Dogecoin, we can have 343 bucks. 343 coin. 343 coin. So, it's anyone listening, you didn't hear this here. This isn't (laughs) an idea you need to steal. No, we want them to invest in it. 
If you're an investor, invest in 343 bucks. We're going not only to the moon, but we're going all the way to the Ark with this thing. What if this already exists? Maybe we should do some market research before we <laughs> endorse something. What if there's already 343 bucks out there? All right, let's reel it in. Reel us in, Orin. Help, you're our handlers. The Covenant continues to do their gallivanting around the galaxy and destroying things, and eventually the High Prophet of Truth took advantage of the rivalry between the Sangheili and the Jirohanai to ignite his own sort of goals to achieve the Great Journey and thus initiating the Great Schism by allowing the Jirohanai to take command of the Covenant military and the Honor Guard and then phase the Sangheili out, no longer thinking that they're the worthy species to do so. And then thus the Brutes started getting all high and mighty and this of like I said, ignited the Great Schism, which is the event of sort of the, the internal civil war within the Covenant. And while the UNSC and Master Chief were doing their things, like we all know, took advantage of that opportunity to then destroy the Covenant as we knew it to be. After the Covenant fell, very quickly, many Jirohanai returned to Doisak, resulting in the Vahiloth and the Ratol re-engaging their petty civil war conflicts of years old. Shit, really? They just went right back to it, huh? No no lost beats. They're like, oh man, that sucks. Let's start killing each other again, I guess. Like, oh, got the great journey's a lie? Well, the one thing that I know to be true is that you're wrong, and then they just go back and continue bickering. Uh, oh, our entire our entire li- existence is a lie? Well, you're fucking stupid and I hate you. I'm gonna kill the shit out of you now. <laughs> This is sounding far too much like real life. As someone who lives in a part of the world with two communities at each other's throat a lot of the time, this is hitting close to home. Aww. Well, fuck you, Aaron. I'm gonna come over there and... Do I come and fight with some people? We'll fight you. Uh, I'll fight Bailey. I'll die, but I'll fight her. No, she <laughs> likes women. You'd be fine. Your final stand. It'll be a very one-sided fight. Aw, oh, she seems cute. I love her. Um, there are, of course, other Jirohanai that did not return to Doisak and either still believed in the Great Journey or just simply didn't want to continue pettily fighting their race on their home planet and wanted to rule and gain their own self-proclaimed power. And they you know, continue to travel the gal- galaxy in this post-Human Covenant wartime. And we learned a little bit about them through different mediums and books. So Jirohanai effectively are just spread out through the galaxy with most of them returning to their home world and the rest either continuing the goals of the covenant or starting and following the banished or doing their own sort of thing. And, and you know, those different pockets of, of clans are explored in other Halo novels that we won't really get into. But I will say that Halo Envoy is a very interesting kind of isolated novel that talks about a very particular brute clan and their leader that I think is uh you know my shout out for uh for the show. Can I add that to the list? It's a very long list. Your your list should have just every Halo book. Is your on is it your list point. about 35 books long cuz that's about how many Halo books there that's are. That's all the Halo books. You're going to be disappointed in me. I've listened to listen to I want to say New Blood, is it or is it Bad Blood? Which one the came first, first? The first one's New Blood. New Blood. Okay, yeah, so I've listened to New Blood, Fall of Reach, and Shadows of Reach, and I've read the Kilo 5 trilogy, and also, I want to say, the one that introduces the detective. Last Light. I was going to say Last Light, yeah. I've read four and then done three audiobooks, and that's it. Well, that's that's definitely more than I was giving you credit for, so. (laughs) You're on your way. Thank you. There we go. Back in the good books. Am I rehired? Yes, yes. Your contract has been extended. We'll we'll leave it at that. Am I still on probation? Yeah. (laughs) You have to read all the Halo books to even be considered a full-time member. Right now, you're just a contract employee. Cool. I can deal with that. (laughs) All right. So then our last sort of topic here is something that I will then kind of lead into our Halo Infinite discussion, and that is known Jural Hanai clans within the Banished specifically. Kind of throughout Halo's long media list and stories, different clans kind of appear and some are named, some are not named. It's a little ambiguous here, a little more specific there. So uh, we didn't want to start listing all the known clans. So right now, minor spoilers from Halo Shadows of Reach, 
and kind of minor spoilers from Halo Last Light and Retribution. These are these are different clans that we know of that are in the Banished that are also at a grander scale than just clans. They're actually considered legions, and one of them is actually more of like a religious clan. So you might want to, if you really don't want to know, there are minor spoilers, but I don't, I don't think it's that bad if you haven't read that book, but we'll kind of just get into it. So the first one we have is the Keepers of the One Freedom. And we've talked about them, like I said, in our uh, Covenant Remnants, when we also talked about the Banished and kind of their the Banished history. In present day Halo, they are a part of the Banished as their own group, their own entity, because they are kind of a religious clan comprised of multiple clans within it. And they're led by not a chieftain, but a Dokab caster. And and all a Dokab is, is is a sort of reverent title for their for their leader. They're within the Banished. They align with them for you know, similar ideals, but they have their own sort of beliefs as well that, you know, warrant its own episode. But for the sake of, of kind of what we're talking about here, it's that, you know, they're a religious clan within the Banished. Then we have two other military clans that were talked upon in Shadows of Reach. We have the Ravage Tusks, which is led by Chieftain Ballas. And they're known to be smugglers and slavers. You know, the chieftain Ballas, he, you know, he's the chieftain because he's the leader of this clan, but he's also a legion master, kind of gets that title because he is the leader of his, you know, the, the Ravage Tux is considered a giant legion, which is, you know, within the banished armada. If you kind of think about it that way, just in terms of the scale that we're working with here. The other known legion that we have is the Legion of the Corpse Moon, which is led by chieftain. That one's so cool. Duke, Duke Lion, I believe is how you say it. He is also a Legion Master, you know, leads multiple clans within his Legion of, of uh, military clans. And they are known to be Raiders. And a little bit of history for their name. The name pulls from one of Dosak's moon, because it has three moons, like I said earlier, which is Soriapt. Soirapt, I believe. <laughs> and that, that moon is nicknamed the Corpse Moon because it is lifeless. So they, they don't hail from that moon. Of course, they hail from Doisak. But they, you know, this might have some religious sort of undertones in there because prior to the covenant, Jirilhan, I believed in the moon cycle and, and worshiped totems and relics and things like that. So there could be some, you know, mix between religious and military clans. So the reason I highlight these three is because if we see these three clans or these legions in Halo Infinite, great. But if we don't, it does invite the opportunity for other clans to be discovered and and us, you know, learned about and to see what their history is within Halo Infinite. And with these different clans, also invite different sort of encounters. So to kind of open it up to the floor, the kind of first thing I have here is that, you know, we obviously will see the Jiro Hanai and Halo Infinite. They're a part of the Banished. And so are, you know, other species from the quote unquote, you know, for, from the Covenant that were kind of used to playing over the past 20 years. But so do, do we think that with these different clans being sectioned within the Banished, as we fight our way through Installation 07 to do whatever the Master Chief needs to do, will we learn or see any of the culture of the Jiro Hanai that we've kind of seen before or maybe haven't seen in a video game or haven't even learned about on Zeta Halo? Or do we kind of think that it might be a little bit more surface, just military operations of the banished forces in a general sense? So I don't know who wants to just kind of take it off from there, but kind of how do you how do you see some of this being incorporated into the gameplay and the art style? I think it depends whether there's going to be like audio logs or something along those lines. I could see them kind of diving into kind of the general Jirohane culture through something like that, but I don't think we're going to be seeing it in gameplay okay i think it depends on the format that halo infinite has what it really boils down to is the timeline i think that that will ultimately influence it so say for example the banished forces that we see on sector halo have just arrived not long ahead of us then they wouldn't have had time to establish themselves on the ring. They're going to be very defensive, and it's likely that they're going to have their guard up, essentially. So naturally, you wouldn't really get to see more of those uh, more cultural-focused behaviours anyway. But I, I think kind of looking at 
sort of what they've got established around their AA guns in the E3 trailer, there's quite a sizable presence. Like, they've got a lot of modules and fortifications in place that suggests that they've been on the ring for a while. So I could easily see them factoring in some things as a part of the gameplay, where, say, for example, you're the chief, you're going into a banished base in active camo, with a suppressor to do an objective because you've not got the manpower to do a full frontal assault, it might be that while you're going through the base, perhaps some of the idle behaviours have little nods to the culture and also how they interact with the other species like the Ungoy. I, I think that would be quite easy for them to implement, especially if you kind of have those different levels of alertness across the facilities that are on the ring. But I think if it's a case of, oh, Esherim has deployed us here and we are going to do this objective right away, then there probably wouldn't be any natural way to explore it beyond something additional like Krista says. I hate to mention the dreaded D word, but Tom can relate to me with this one. When you play in the open world in Division, you will sometimes come across factions fighting... (laughs) You sometimes come across factions fighting each other where you're not involved, very similar to the Flood and the Covenant fighting in earlier Halos. So I could easily see that, even though they're all the Banished, and they've already established this in mild spoilers for Shadows of Reach, that... They're not all getting along and they like to fight among themselves, even though they're like working for one unified goal. So I could very easily see different factions in an open world fighting with each other or maybe something like a Far Cry. Maybe you can coax a faction or a patrol to follow you and then have a different patrol take them out, lead them into an enemy camp, things like that. Like that's a very easy way to establish a little brute culture personality very quickly the first thing that i thought of when i was reading shadows of reach and kind of got this sort of background on these different clans and legions and and like you said aaron they're they're sort of inter-clan bickering and fighting is how i think it would be really interesting and and add to the world of the banished and kind of the the just the how the the faction is orchestrated is if yeah you're you're walking through the ring and, you, you know, you open up your map and you have three different missions, but all three of those different missions are on different parts of the ring that are controlled by different types of clans. And because, you know, the, the, the objective could be fairly similar between the three, but because those three have unique characteristics that we've learned by playing, I think it, it would be so great if, if that helps influence gameplay choices and kind of how you know do is is one camp more sniper and fortified whereas another camp is a little bit more open and hand-to-hand you know that would influence how we approach those encounters and and i think the art team can definitely go a little bit more with so it's not just kind of the basic red armor that we see in like halo wars 2 where everything is unified and we can still have that unity but maybe we have banners or or different insignias to kind of denote the subtle change in clans and stuff like that and i think i'm not necessarily hoping but i think it'd be a really cool opportunity for 343 if they were to if they had the time and resources to explore that it would it would just very much enrich the the kind of gameplay and replayability of of the game are you ready for me to set on realistic expectations that are gonna absolutely crush you when the game releases and they're not in there (laughs) i live for that well, get ready, Krista, I'm about to give you a full dose. Kind of using Ubisoft games as a sort of template for this, when you're talking about having different factions sort of created differently, that's something that Ubisoft have been doing for a really long time. If you look at Far Cry 3 as a really good example, it had two distinct factions. You had the private military corporation who came in towards the end with loads of high-end technology, vehicles, heavily armed guys, and then you had Vars' pirate group who were just a bunch of ragtag guys who couldn't give less of a shit basically and were just running around with AK-47s. So it's kind of like very much that mixed divide. And I, I could easily see them doing something like that and I think it's arguably more likely now because of the microtransaction system that they're experimenting with, especially with the season pass. Because if you think about it, even that currently, 
there's a version of the carbine skin in, I think it's Halo 3, that is a keeper's skin. And I could quite easily see them, because I think it's fair to assume that Infinite's going to have a season pass, see them doing like themed season pass content around different factions where they could just pull content that's already in the campaign and put it on on a season pass. So I think from the standpoint of looking at it with financial longevity in mind, it would make sense to have loads of different factions in place so you can then play with that moving forwards. But more to my mind-blowing point, another thing that Ubisoft has done recently, and a really good example of this is Ghost Recon Wildlands, is this idea that you have loads of mini-bosses that affect the main boss, and you do different missions to ultimately impact that mini-boss before you can reveal them. What if, instead of taking out a mini-boss, there were different missions you could do that would destabilise the relationship between the different factions. So kind of similar to that dynamic you see in Shadows of Reach, you could maybe do like a sabotage mission. Political espionage. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's what I want from my Halo. (laughs) I, I could genuinely see them doing something like that, where as a side quest, you sort of weave that distrust within the factions... So then they're fighting each other and you can use that as an advantage to then perhaps lessen the resistance you have on main missions or something along those lines. That would be wild. I'm going to say, and this kind of goes into the next question you're going to ask, Warren. I'm going to say the other D word. Not division, but <laughs> destiny. <laughs> We got double D's here. I'm not that caught up with Destiny, but Destiny has been doing this cool thing with their seasons that all of their seasons come with not only, you know, player content with, like, armor and bullshit like that. It also comes with a new, like, story thing that goes on for this entire season. For So for three months, there's, like, a story thing going on with, like, cutscenes and then there's an objective and shit like that. So it would be interesting to see if Halo Infinite was going to do post content that maybe some of the post content will be revolving around one particular like person or clan or something like that oh okay yeah that's that's a very easy avenue to yeah like say say the ravage tux is in infinite you could have a the season of the ravage tusks so to speak yeah that's i could see that very easily being implemented by taking that that's a good point going back to the first d word I almost wonder, there's a lot of D's in this episode, I almost wonder if they're going to do something similar to Division 2, where, say for example, you defeat Esherim in the core campaign, maybe after you defeat him, a lot of the factions start vying for your attention, so maybe you get that Division after you kill the figurehead that's unifying them all, and in the wake of it, they will begin fighting each other, and it kind of opens up a whole new conflict. I could see that being quite a natural way of then leading into future stories. The thing that gets me is at the end of Shadows of Reach, they have the who's who of the banished parade where they name drop a load of people and then clearly had no mention of them. But if you told me you were going to have to take a different one out each season in Infinite as post-game content, I could like totally see that. Destabilize a faction maybe drive a faction into another faction. There's a lot of potential with one big all-encompassing enemy that still fight with each other on top of everything else. So I could see stuff like that or Season of the Corpse Moon. You could go either way with that sort of shit. You could have one or the other. So like, I think it's handy the way they have that, that Banished can line up and be whatever we need them to be. Yeah, I get that. So... Here's some food for thought. Let's say, for example, that the Harbinger isn't Cortana in Halo Infinite. I know we've speculated that it probably is, but say it isn't. Could you potentially see a point in the campaign where the created show up and some of the banished legions align with them and some of them don't and it kind of creates a divide there? Could you guys see stuff like that maybe happening in it? I, I totally could. It would be interesting to fight three clans that are with Cortana and get the, the the technological advances of Cortana and the Prometheans 
and then you fare them against the 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 true banished then that that you know offers varied gameplay between the two sort of enemy factions that you're fighting against you know like like think of the um the grunt goblin that was created for Halo 5 Warzone the goblin was created by Cortana and the created and kind of gave that to the grunts and kind of you know rose their status by having this formidable you know mechanized grunt that can run around and so just think about what the banished or what the created are able to do to a a banished clan and kind of elevate them to you know give them promethean firepower and things like that and and there there's your third faction within you know a banished sort of divide so i i could totally see that being something that they they embrace well, I think I think we should wrap it up there. We're approaching our time and this conversation, I think kind of unexpectedly for me anyway, kind of leads into what we're going to be talking about next on the Road to Infinite. This is if you're keeping track and counting episode 15. We're going to do 20 episodes. We've we've kind of planned out which ones we're going to be doing. And the the next 4 episodes are going to be a little different in format up until this point. We've kind of given a lore topic, whether it's a, you know, like a clan or an enemy or a belief or an event, whatever, whatever it's been over the past 15 episodes, we've kind of given you a history of that and its place in the Halo universe and talked about how it would either influence or appear or bring back into Halo Infinite. So we've kind of contextualized it mainly on a lore sort of basis. The next four episodes that we're going to do, we're, we're going to take a look at the game side of it. And so we'll be looking at all of the Halo games and taking pieces from them to see how they will translate into Halo Infinite because we've already started seeing some of those, you know, classic art styles and gameplay mechanics surfacing through the July showcase last year, as well as some of the Infinite blogs that have been coming out monthly for, you know, 2021. You know, as of recording this, today's the 21st of February, just for context. And so the next episode that we're going to be doing for the month of March is open world and post-launch content. And so we kind of talked a little bit about that today, which I think is good. So then we can just build on that next time. And we'll be looking at what a Halo open world means, how open world has been handled in Halo in prior games, because it, it, you know, was kind of touched upon in Halo ODST. And what we think poach launch content really means. And we, like I said, we touched a little bit on that. And so we'll, we'll be tackling that next. And then the, th- the remaining three episodes after that, we'll dive into other sort of gameplay centric topics within our last final episode. Uh, you know, I don't want to spoil anything, but it'll, it'll kind of be a return to our sort of lore and be a nice uh, segue and in, in kind of final episode as we go into infinite itself this fall so with that i will take it away to tom to close us out yeah so thank you for joining us we hope you've enjoyed this show like we mentioned at the top of the show you can find every episode to all of our shows on our website which is halopodcastevolve.com or you can also search for their unique podcast feed if you want to listen to everything all in one feed then follow halo podcast evolved on your favorite podcast service and please do make sure to leave us a review once again another special shout out to all of our patrons for supporting this show and for making all of this possible head to patreon.com slash halo podcast evolved to learn more and finally if you want to leave us a voicemail about this episode a previous episode or about anything else halo related or not halo related <laughs> oh no oh no <laughs> he opened the, he opened the can <laughs> give us a call at 205-evolved that's 205-386-5833 a number which makes no sense to me as a british kid <laughs> with all of that said i've been your host tom and until next time evolve evolved, evolved. I wonder who wins in a fight, a gorilla or a brute? <laughs> Probably a brute. They have guns. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> Assuming we arm the gorillas, like, to make it equal. The gorillas would probably have as much of a chance as shooting themselves as shooting a brute. I don't think they know how to deal with firearms. Like, gorillas are almost more, I don't know what the technology scale is, but their, their technological capabilities and intelligent levels are either on par, if not higher than humans. And gorillas is, is below humans. At least Earth Earth gorillas. You're not thinking of Winston from Overwatch. Oh, shit. We're fucked if Winston from Overshot. Or all the, the apes from Planet of the Apes movies. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you have, uh, what's his name? Andy Serkis. He's a pretty smart guy. Free for free. This is a crossover we need now. <laughs> we need a definitive answer. Let's just make a, like an Xbox Smash. We'll have Overwatch <laughs> characters, and we'll have a bunch of Halo characters, and have it brute te- like themed, and call it Smash Hammer Smash. Time. <laughs> we could have Godzilla and King Kong in there. That'd oh my god, I'm sold! Can we have Rexy from Jurassic Park? Yes, of course. Whatever you want. Let's put the Harry Potter characters in there too, just for fun. <laughs> Trolls, warlocks. So welcome to the Anything We Feel Like Talking About podcast. Yeah, there you go. That's secretly always been podcast of all. <laughs> it's like we have a script, but you know. Yeah, we, we've been lying to ourselves for years. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're just loosely tied to Halo. Yeah. Who knows? I know Elon Musk likes Dogecoin, so maybe we could get Elon Musk on the 343 train. Do you reckon we could get him as a guest on the podcast? He did. He did talk about Halo in one tweet, and the entire Halo community hasn't shut up about it since, so maybe we can. I'm sure he would love to talk about the one console video game he's played one Ever time. played, and he probably played it for like 20 minutes. He probably he's doesn't like, even uh, remember it. No, probably not. <laughs> he was probably like, this isn't scientifically accurate. I hate video games. Uh, may- maybe Halo's the reason he doesn't play video games anymore, you know? I would I would love Elon Musk to come on our podcast and shit talk Halo. I think that would be a good experience. <laughs> Maybe he'll give us all Teslas as a uh, as a reward for having the best Halo podcast. So uh, if you're listening and you're still hearing this, it's a miracle that all of this stayed in. Yeah. It's a miracle that he would be listening to this. <laughs> it is Turns a miracle. He's, a, he's wow. still a fan of the show. Elon, I'm talking directly to you right now. Well done, my dude. Well done. <laughs> Elon, where are the cat girls? You promised us cat girls and I still haven't gotten any. It's amazing that this episode's going to be 15 minutes long by the time I edit it. <laughs> <laughs> All of the, like, nonsense. All right, let's reel it in. Reel us in, Oren. Help, Um, you're our handlers. 